You're listening to City of Muses on Paris Underground Radio. Welcome to the season two premiere of City of Muses on Paris Underground Radio. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. I'm a screenwriter, filmmaker, and the creator and founder of the Paris Underground Radio Podcast Network. Each week, I sit down with an artist or creative to talk about what inspires them, what their creative process is like, and how Paris plays into it all. Lori Catherine Winkle is an American actress and voiceover artist who followed her passions to Paris, where she graduated from the prestigious Cours Florent Acting School. As an actress performing in both France and the U.S. in shows like MacGyver and Squidbillies and films like Father of the Bride and They Wait in the Dark, Lori is in a unique position to talk about what it's like to work in both countries and what she sees as key differences in their approaches to acting. From Disney Princess to Rabid Video Game Rabbit, Lori shares her personal experiences in the industry and how they've shaped her path. Hello, Lori. Thank you so much for speaking with me tonight. Thanks for having me. I'm very happy to meet you. I'm excited to get a chance to speak with you. Can you tell our listeners who you are and what you do? I'm Lori Catherine Winkle. I am an actress. I do voiceover, film, TV, everything. <laughs> There's that from leg creeping in. <laughs> uh, I do audiobook narration, comedy. I do a little bit of everything. And I'm originally from Corn Country, USA, and then I moved to Atlanta for a while, and here I am in Paris now. So let's go back to the beginning. Uh, how old were you when you were bitten by the acting bug, and how did that happen? I think I was about eight. My parents enrolled me in a um, summer theater camp. The play was um, Hair Junior, and I remember my... <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little known... <laughs> And for people who are not familiar with hair, it is a show about hippies. It involves a lot of drugs and sexuality and, and nudity on stage. So famously, <laughs> I remember the day I came home and told my mother, oh, they told us we're going to do a show called Hair. And my mother was like, uh, <laughs> she said, well, what, what did they tell you about that? I was like, oh, they're hippies. I learned what a hippie is. They have tie dye shirts and they like peace and flowers. And my mother was like, Okay, okay. It's good that she was supportive. It wasn't until years later that I, I think at the end, I've still never actually seen hair. I think at the end he gets drafted and goes and dies in the war or something. Um, in our version, he turned out to be an alien. And oh. Yeah, the people on his, the people, the extraterrestrials came down and claimed uh, him, the main character, and took him back to space. Anyway, I completely forgot what the question was. Yeah, theater camp. I started doing uh, films in high school. I had uh, I met this guy who made a 16 millimeter horror exploitation grindhouse film when I was when I was 15. <laughs> All about like a bunch of men in a farmhouse getting chopped up by chainsaws and stuff. And uh, I thought it was the absolutely greatest thing I'd ever done. It was a huge huge challenge for a teenage boy making a 16 millimeter film. And um, yeah, it was pretty much just hooked from then on. So never stopped. Fabulous. Was your family always supportive of you as an actor? Um, I think my, my parents are still surprised that it pays because, uh, you know, growing up, I just assumed you were either a stri starving artist or a celebrity and there's nothing in between. And now it's become clearer that there are people who work and live and sometimes you work a side job and sometimes you get lucky and you don't have to. But um they were always supportive in their own way. Like my mother really encouraged the theater. Uh, she thought it was great. I don't think they thought it was a viable career path until more recently when um, I started making a living doing it. Like I think she was always hoping I was gonna <laughs> gonna be a lawyer or a social worker as like a side, and acting would be a side thing. You know, I, I think she imagined a lawyer who would do community theater on the weekends or something. <laughs> But um, I think they, they, they're on board with it. And, and I was lucky. They were never unsupportive, never tried to make me stop or, you know, uh, force me into anything I, I wasn't interested in doing. So. And where did your interest in France come from? You know, um, I, I'm still not really sure. I started <laughs> kind of teaching myself French in high school because I was dissatisfied with the classes I was taking. 
the first thing I went to a Catholic school, so the first thing we ever had to learn was the Our Father or Notre Père in France. And we learned it phonetically. So we, we like stood and did this prayer every single day that we had learned phonetically. And um, I was sort of teaching myself because I, I wasn't satisfied with the course offerings. So, uh, but I don't really know exactly. I, I, I never grew up with Eiffel Towers on my wall or anything. I studied abroad on a whim in my sophomore or junior year of college in Angers. And it was just a mind-blowing experience to me. I mean, it was only the second time I'd ever left the country. And everything, every little thing was new and exciting. And even when I was miserable and hemorrhaging money and everything went wrong, like every possible thing went wrong on that trip. And I, I still had such an amazing, I mean, I went to bed, uh, my head was just swimming with like new grammatical things I had learned that day. And I, I was just so excited and overstimulated all the time that I, I knew I had to come back. And so how did you come back? I came back right after college. And I, I, I made an effort to keep the French up throughout college. And um, I graduated, I did this program called TAPIF, Teaching Assistant Program in France, where we were planted in a bunch of middle and grade schools. And in my case, I was put in Normandy, in a tiny town called Fécamp. I was just kind of stuck into into um, a situation and didn't know anything about it going into it. I thought I was going to be like standing alongside a teacher. And then it turns out I basically was given my own classes to, to teach. And I had, I had no real experience teaching. <laughs> but I was, I was supposed to be helping these teenagers uh, learn English because they never got the chance to speak. And it was, again, it was amazing. I mean, it's a far cry from Paris in terms of excitement and the nature of the city and everything. It was a much, you know, smaller, calmer city. But I just truly love speaking French. And, and that is such a thrill for me still. But that, that got me to stay in France for another year. And then I hopped onto this Disney Park audition, not really knowing what that was either. <laughs> Common thread here. And <laughs> I was acting in this Disneyland Paris show called uh, Frozen Sing Along or Chantons la Reine des Neiges. And thanks to that, I was able to stay another like six months and do the starving artist thing for a few months in Paris. Who did you play? You know, in, when you work for the <laughs> parks, you're not supposed to say you say uh, I was a friend of. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I was a friend of Elsa. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I live above a uh, maternelle, which is like a nursery school. And there was, a, I don't know, five year period of time where I would hear that song from Frozen like a million times a day. It haunts my nightmares. Probably at least once a day, I get one of those songs stuck in my head. And, and, and I'm not exaggerating. And then the other day it was Halloween and I, and still it's such a phenomenon. I'm still seeing little girls dress as Elsa left and right. And every time I see it in my head, I, I think the fir the lyrics is I I'm, I won't sing it. <laughs> I never get it out of my head. I and I I wanted it to be good, so I studied the French so 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 hard and practiced it over and over and over again. So I, I know it a little bit better in French now than English, but the the songs still like haunt my nightmares. <laughs> and <I'm pretty> sure <laughs> mine too. Yeah, you too. <laughs> yeah, mine too. Luckily, they've moved on to other things, but there's never been another phenomenon like that. Like not before or since has there been one song where the kids would sing every day over and over again. Uh, it made me want to jump out the window. I mean, they're sure they're cute, but oh my God. It's so hard to sing. I kind of resent that they write these songs that are so difficult for children to sing. I mean, it, I think they should make it fun and easy for children to sing. I think it would probably be easier on their parents to um, than a song that makes them like scream their heads off. But uh, it is beautiful, so... Was this your first like major grown up production? Oh, it was not my first major production, but it was it was probably my biggest theater experience in terms of just like the scale. It was a pretty big budget. We did a French and an English show every day. And this is, you know, a shortened show because it's for a Disney park, so but every day I was able to perform for like thousands of people and celebrities came to the show sometimes and I think it was my very first show where Josh Gad showed up because he just happened to be in a Disney park that day and he tweeted about it and I was like thank god I didn't know he was there because I probably would have passed out from nerves yeah it, I mean it was really 
it was really something. I didn't really get to interact with the children very much, but it was it was a strange phenomenon. It was the kind of thing that really messes with your head a little bit because was, I was just getting a lot of attention for looking like a cartoon character and you know <laughs> artistic challenges. It was not the most artistically challenging thing I've ever done, but it was overall a really a really fun experience and it allowed me to stay another six months in Paris, which was again a real game changer for me. So. I imagine it must be a really weird like dissociation to be a celebrity, but not for being yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, I, because I was so incredibly anonymous and honestly, nobody could have cared less. Even in terms of my performance, it was just about ticking a bunch of boxes. And I don't know if the other performers felt that way because I was far from the only one to do this character. Every other day, somebody would just show up and they wouldn't always introduce themselves. They would just come backstage and they would say things to me like, um, you know, that's not really like the regulation Elsa arm shape. Like you really need to lift the elbow so that your arm is at this angle. <laughs> and I'd be like, who are you? <laughs> like, oh, I'm the manager of uh, public affairs of the Florida branch of blah, 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 you know. Oh, wow. In a... Um, as a theater actor, normally you you don't really get notes of the first performance. I mean, generally, at least of all from some stranger who from a corporate office who just wandered in. And that's what a lot of it was, was just very corporate. But I really enjoyed like when people asked me to record little videos for their daughter's birthday and, and when children sent like drawings backstage and stuff. I kept all of them. I still have them all somewhere. <laughs> That's lovely. So I know that you, beyond uh, beyond Disney, I know that you've done film and television and theater in the US and in France, if I'm not mistaken. I'm really curious about some of the differences that you've noticed in terms of productions and production style, how they're run, that sort of thing. Yeah, well, my exposure is a little bit more limited here to um, like major film shoots because, uh, I mean, to speak totally frankly, I just don't get the kind of work here that I got back home. I'm in it for the uh, adventure, but career-wise, it's been a little slow. I do a lot of uh, corporate gigs, like all the time. Like my next month is almost booked solid with like corporate videos and things, balancing studies and and stuff. But uh, back home, I was auditioning for television all the time. Here, it's like a lot of things that are specifically seeking out native English speakers. So I won't get the same audition as a French actress, for example. Nine time, 99% of the time, I won't be able to read for the same roles because they're like, I, I'm in a smaller box here. But differences I've noticed is that things move more slowly here in terms of shooting like in a TV market like Atlanta or LA. You know, you, you have to send in this self-tape the day you received it or the next day very frequently and sometimes like I got a call after I had moved here that was like oh this role you were up for a year ago you you didn't get it but they wrote a sister character to that role and they want you to work tomorrow and I I I couldn't there was just no way there was no possible way I could be there so I was really disappointed (laughs) like I really only not even 24 hours notice like I here it's like um I send in an audition and then Maybe six months later, I'll get a text or an email. It's like, we're so sorry. It didn't work out for this one. I'm like, oh, I mean, yeah, that was, (laughs) but it's really nice of you to respond. Like you don't, you don't hear back in the States. You you don't get a sorry, but no, you, you get nothing. You send it off into the void and you try to forget about it. Uh, Other than that, I mean, a lot of things work similarly. It's just that there's not as much big budget TV thing, or at least not that I'm exposed to. There's not quite the frequency of production here. What happens when a 21-year-old college student from a small town in Kansas, who has never even before stepped foot in a big American city, decides to hop on a plane and spend her summer in Paris, France? Well, that's what award-winning student journalist Abby Riffle just did. And, lucky for us, She recorded her experiences along the way, beginning a month before she left and ending a month after she got back. Abby will take you along for the ride in the brand new podcast, A Broadening My Horizons on Paris Underground Radio, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. We'll be right back with City of Muses after a word from our sponsors. 
And now, back to City of Muses on Paris Underground Radio. So then I'm going to ask you a question that I'm sure you get asked a million times that I've also been asked a million times. Why, if you are an actress, are you here in Paris and not in New York or L.A.? <laughs> Uh, a few reasons. I love New York, but I don't think I would ever live in LA. I did move from Atlanta, which is a much bigger market than people realize. Why am I here? I, <laughs> I It's such an easy answer and yet such a difficult one for me. I'm here because it's one of the greatest cities in the world and I'm living an adventure even when it's hard and lonely. And even the act of speaking French to me is kind of a slight adventure every day <laughs> taking acting classes in French auditioning in French even when I'm booking English gigs for the most part I'm still you know I'm exposed to a lot of different cultures here I'm constantly learning and stimulated by things and you know to be totally honest things are not going that well in the states right now and I'm not I'm not eager to get back there right now not just the strike, but also just uh, any any number of, of reasons. But I think that I had hoped that I would be working in TV here. I think I, I was hoping I was going to be auditioning for like Netflix series and um, even like silly daytime soaps and things like that. I was thinking I would be exposed to those auditions. And even with an agent, I haven't necessarily gotten a lot of that kind of thing. So but I've I've been doing more theater than usual. Usually, you know, some of it's very amateur, some of it's more professional. But uh, why am I here? Why am I here? I think that was a great answer. <laughs> yeah, the other reason is I'm now doing a master's. And before I even get into, you know, what the master's is about and my reasons for doing it, which we don't necessarily have to get into, but um, I started it really recently. And in the States, it's super normal to get your master's like in your thirties or something, because you have to wait to financially stabilize or you just don't want to jump right back into school. A lot of people never get their master's or don't want to here. It's usually something you do in your twenties. So I'm like something of a non-traditional student right now, even though I'm 33, <laughs> but uh, I, I went and um, I wasn't sure what it was going to cost me. And I went and paid the other day and I'm like, it was kind of embarrassing. I started crying because they told me they told me the <laughs> the tuition fees and it was even in my wildest dreams uh, so much lower than i expected it cost less than uh, i mean this is what the comparison i've been using for people it cost less than 1 year of a parking pass at my university at the university of kansas <laughs> completely standard university i think our parking passes for the year cost $300 and my Entire year of masters costs less than that. <laughs> wow! I was so moved. Like I, <laughs> not even getting into the quality of the education or or what I'm studying or anything. I was just so moved that that was possible here. That I, I actually, started, I actually started crying. Like, I think I just burst into tears. And the the bursar was like, "You know, if you can't pay today, we have plans." <laughs> I was like, no, it's fine. It's fine. I have had exactly the same experience, but with healthcare. Oh. Like I ended up cutting my foot and needing stitches and all of that. And it was when I first moved here, I wasn't on the, I wasn't in their system yet. And they sent me a bill and I was so scared because I'd had surgery back in the US, which was like tens of thousands of dollars. And I opened it up. <laughs> it was like 15 euros, something like that. Oh. And I cried. And everyone was like, and I had a similar situation where they were like, if you don't have the money right now, it's okay. And I was like, I will use <laughs> Can have no problem. Oh. <laughs> Something so similar happened to me earlier this year. I conked my face against some metro stairs. Um, I, have, I, I mean, I have this little scar. I, I put a little bit of makeup over it. So it's really <laughs> visible. If I had a better camera, you would be able to see it. And it kind of shows what I crinkle my face. With. Yeah, I can see a little, little red something. Well, it's not very big, but it was really deep. I was walking up the stairs. I started to put my hands in my pocket as I was you know, I, I'm a fast walker and I always try to strut around the people who are walking slowly and try to get into those cracks between people. And I, I tripped and my face landed on the corner of the metro stairs. I was sliced and, uh, you know, I was covered in blood, but I thought it wasn't that big a deal because it wasn't big. And 
I waited uh, most of the next day. Uh, I asked a bunch of people's advice. Even a pharmacist told me not to, but eventually I just caved to because I'm, I'm an actress. Like you kind of need to have a face uh, <laughs> presentable. So I went to the ER and I got stitched up, and I finally got the bill like a couple months later. And <laughs> I opened it. I'm like my heart is pounding because I'm you know used to the American system. And I opened it. I guess how much it was. How much? 19 euros. Yeah, it was like the same thing. I'm, I'm amazing. And most of it was reimbursed, I think. Uh, I don't remember now, but it was. Yeah, that, that was the issue is that mine couldn't be reimbursed because I wasn't in the system yet. And I was like, it's fine. You can have 15 euros. Yeah, it's it's ruined us. It's ruined us. <laughs> All right, getting back into acting. So you've acted, I'm curious, you've acted in French and you've acted in English. Yes. Do you feel like you're acting differently in the languages is it easier to access different emotions oh yeah absolutely absolutely I mean everything everything is harder in a language that because I I didn't start speaking French until late teens early 20s and I'm very proud of my French my French is very good but it, it I will always have an accent I will always have pauses like kind of unnatural pauses in my speech and that kind of thing so I've noticed that when it comes to improvising I'm definitely more inhibited I have done a few little indie films with friends where I just felt like I, I couldn't, I couldn't make myself heard. And that's when you kind of, you really have to lean on your craft and other, other tools. So it's a challenge, but um, no, I, it's something I'm, I'm definitely more self-conscious and more inhibited. And there's a sort of, there's a different process that I need to go through. Like I, I personally have to drill the text because I know that I have an accent, but I want the pronunciation to be spot on. I want the uh, diction to be really crisp. And so I end up, and it takes me longer to memorize as well. So I have to drill the text really, really hard. Whereas as an actor, that's not normally the thing I would start with. <laughs> because then you just get this rhythm in your head. that's like you want it to sound a certain way. And that actually kind of inhibits you as an actor. So yeah, everything. I mean, everything is harder, to be totally honest. I think I need more practice. I need more practice with it. I took a few French theater classes as well. And I noticed like, well, for starters, I had to, I had to recreate all my references. You know, I, I grew up with Anglophone, American, British theater. And, you know, some people had a familiarity with some of the same plays. Like I, I knew some of the references, but I had never read Racine. I had never, you know, taken classes with a more French approach. And, and uh, I go to the theater all the time. In France, I go, I go, you know, two to three times a week on a regular week. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, a little bit less right now. But I really observe trends. And there's as part of the subject of my master's actually is that the emotional work just seems radically different. And it's, it's hard for me to put words to which is, I'm in the very beginning of my research, but the emotional work on stage just feels really, really different. It, it feels like, um, we're so used to this in American drama, especially because it's so realistic. It's so based in, in realism that we, we, we have this linear story and our storytelling goes introduction or exposition. The tension rises, the tension rises, climax, denouement, something wraps everything up at the very end. And I think our emotional work kind of reflects that. So we kind of let things cook. We kind of, there's a big explosive moment or a big, climactic moment and then the story resolves itself or or maybe it's left on an ambiguous note but it's still some kind of resolution and in France I've noticed a lot of things really really just like take off running from the beginning which is very interesting to watch but hard for me to work with because I've, I've never if you watch a lot of French TV you'll see people scream at each other all the time and I, I just I find that so surprising I'm, I'm speaking in total generalities here but um I just like, I think if we had a, a, a fight, if you and I were, were doing a scene where we're a couple and we're fighting, it would build to that. You know, I think a lot of times in uh, the French drama, like you start the scene screaming, <laughs> it just goes from there. And that, that's a hard place for me to get to if I'm, if I'm feeling inhibited and I don't know my text well enough. And, and, and it's just not the background that I came from. So I, I'm, tr I'm working really hard on trying to understand that understand whether my impressions are, are correct or whether they're right a lot of the time or if I'm I'm generalizing too much. 
understand how I could work with that place to get to that place. Super interesting. You'll have to come back when you are at the end of your master's so you can tell us what you've learned. (laughs) And I'm I'm doing a theory-based master's too. So it's not, it's going to be research, you know, it's going to be more head in a book and less practical, which I'm hoping that it won't detract from doing work on the side because I'd really love to explore some like bilingual theater here. And I'm trying to help a a friend of mine get his um, English language theater troupe off the ground. And there's just a lot of interesting projects like that that spring up all the time in Paris. I want to talk to you about your voiceover work as well, because I read that you've narrated over 200 books. Is that right? I have. Yeah. Yeah. Under my own name and under a pseudonym. Okay. (laughs) Why a pseudonym? Are they like steamy? A lot of them are steamy, yeah. So in the audiobook world, there's a lot of work in erotica. And it's important not to call it porn because it's not porn. It's erotica. It's 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 an art form. (laughs) There's really no taboo in the world of audiobooks and narration as far as being somebody who narrates that. Almost everybody does it. And it's a lot of fun, over-the-top characters. I get to finally do some of my accent work. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I started narrating, it's been, I'd say it's been about 10 years now. And um, I, I really, I still do erotica, although lately I've been doing quite a lot of this subgenre called game lit, which is very popular with like game and science fiction fans. And they have a very rabid fan base that's really excited to get new audiobooks, but uh, there's are almost more like audio dramas. I work with a company called Sound Booth Theater, for example, and another company called Podium. It's a lot of stories where people are like stuck in a game or they've uploaded their consciousness into a game so that they can escape their dystopia and things like that. Or there are just game elements to a fantasy world. And that's been fun because the fans are like really, really vocal and really specific about what they like. And I get to do a lot of crazy voices for those. And I get to meet some of the people who who listen to them at like conferences and things. Oh, okay. But I think if I had a choice, I would probably do more young adult, like teenage teenage books. Those are my favorite. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you why. Uh, I think partly because they've gotten so dark, and there's just something really <laughs> about yeah. a teen book that's just really really dark. You know, I, I really like narrating the ones that are like. I'm I'm 18 and I live in a desert wasteland. They killed my whole family and I have to survive, you know, and <laughs> they're just delightful. And I think they still have quite a fair amount of voices and accents and things, but they are more sophisticated. I think most of the ones I narrate are geared towards upper teens, mature teens. I think my voice is probably too deep to do a lot of small children's books. It requires a lot of like, like no kid voices and it's it's not really my (laughs) my best area but you know so it's been it's been a lot of steady audiobook work for a long time but I do uh, occasionally get to do video games or that kind of thing Is Paris the most romantic city in the world? Host Lily Heisey answers this very question in her podcast Romancing in Paris which takes you through the city arrondissement by arrondissement by exploring the most romantic and hidden spots Paris has to offer. Listen now to Romancing in Paris on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with City of Muses after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to City of Muses on Paris Underground Radio. What's it like voicing a video game character? Uh, the real shame about that is that it's usually only a day or two in the studio. I did one here. It was uh, Mario and Rabbids Sparks of Hope, where I was Rabbid Rosalina, and that that was here in Paris. And I was just, uh, I really enjoyed doing it. It was only two days, three days in the studio. We just like hundreds upon hundreds of lines, and and this, <laughs> and this one was like eighty five percent noises. <laughs> That's a weird. That's a weird experience. Yeah, sometimes they'll like play. They'll like play a video for you. Uh, with no sound and, and you know you'll provide you know they'll play it for you once or twice and then you'll go through and almost like you're looping it uh or you're just being inspired by the video and providing sounds a lot of it's effort noises sometimes there's no video but you know they'll give you an idea of what the character looks like and what their personality is like and then the best part i think is effort noises where 
you'll be at the microphone and they'll say like, okay, stabbed in the stomach. Give me like a one to a 10. So you'd be like, ugh, ugh, ugh. you know, and it gives us an intensity. I mean, maybe stab in the stomach isn't the best example because that's pretty much already a 10. <laughs> um, you know, things like a, a hit, you know, it'd be like a hit in the stomach for just a random character. Give me a one, two, three. So it'll be like, ugh, 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 you know, and the intensity augments. <laughs> that's one, that's one way people work. That's not. That's fun. It'll be like jumps and a lot of running sound, <laughs> you know, and um, <laughs> d- like a little, little fighting noises uh, or big fighting noises. You know, I had one that was like, <laughs> you're being like ripped apart. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did one for um, Walking Dead, March to War, where there was somebody getting their arm cut off. Oh, no. And so, <laughs> just like in a tiny closet sized room, just like screaming like you're being dismembered and you know the video games only come along once in a while for me anyway but when they do they're those are really fun a lot of times it's more like corporate stuff and you know radio commercials and things like that. But. yeah that's really interesting do you find that you have more or different freedoms when you're doing voiceover work versus acting on camera oh i mean you know i think yes definitely i mean certainly especially if you're working with a client who just trusts you to send stuff your way and tells you to finish it and send it back. And then they'll give you notes or something. But uh, anytime you're working on a camera, you have to deal with so many other factors. You know, you can only move like a quarter of an inch this way or that way, because otherwise you'll be out of frame or try not to jiggle your leg in this shot because we can see it shaking your shoulders and it looks weird. There's, there's so many, like your eye line is slightly to the left, but the actor's not here. So you're, we're going to have you look at this like piece of tape over here. There's just so many things that <laughs> there's so many tiny technicalities when it comes to TV acting or film acting. And it's so hard to master all of the little technical things. And then, be free and uninhibited in your performance. Even, that, even then, sometimes they're going to pick what you think is your worst take. Like you're going to watch it and you're going to cringe inside being like, Oh my God, why did they pick that take? I made such a stupid expression or, <laughs> or like my voice dropped out in that moment and it feels fake or, you know, everything is out of your control. Do you find it hard to watch yourself on camera? Agonizing. Agonizing. I, if I'm in a situation where I'm watching myself on the big screen, there's a small percentage of thrill and happiness, but there's, for me, it's super overwhelmed by the anxiety of it. Like um, I had a film playing at a, a film festival in London last year and I still hadn't seen it. And I was absolutely terrified to watch it. Like I, I was sitting there having almost a panic attack and trying to contain it. Uh, I was trying to contain it because I knew that I had to uh, speak to the public afterwards. And every time I came on screen, I was like, I just, I, my, my hands were like shaking. And I was like clinging to the, um, it's not always that way, but it just happened to be that way, that specific day. <laughs> and we were, I was watching it with a bunch of like directors and producers I had just met over the course of that week. And I was just really like just dying on the inside of nerves. Um, and, and then I did a little like interview afterwards and I'm not really accustomed to doing interviews like a red carpet style interview for this film festival. And oh God, they, they asked me, I'm cringing just thinking about it. They asked me, um, and this is the, the worst part. This is the only part of the interview I remember. <laughs> so this sticks out in my head, like so clearly. <laughs> they asked me if there were movies that like inspired me. And they were like, oh, this is usually a question we reserve for directors, but maybe you as an actor have... An answer to this too. What what movies have inspired your career? I said Roman Polanski's Repulsion, which, which a complete fabrication, total lie. <laughs> it was the only movie I could think of because when people ask like young filmmakers that question, they always respond with something like Roman Polanski's Repulsion, and so I, <laughs> it was like a, a joke that I I made with a friend that uh, it's one of those like five movies everybody you know that in 2001 space odyssey or whatever everybody, yeah yeah like their most influential movie and it was a joke 
but it was the only thing I could think of in that moment. So I said it and it wasn't a joke. When I, said it, you know, I was like, what were you talking about? Roman Polanski? What are you talking about? Oh, horrible. And <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> I know. I feel Even now I'm, I'm cringing, just dying on the inside. I don't think that that interview aired anywhere. I don't even think it's on the YouTube channel. So, Well, it makes for a good story now on the other side of it. <laughs> <laughs> telling the story I have to admit that I answered it that way and I don't remember anything else I don't remember a thing besides that I was I you know to be honest I think I had I think I had gone out the night before and I was probably uh, still a little hungover I was, and I was just so so high anxiety and, and nervous and just got to be like on all the time and like calm and cool I mean that's a rough question to have someone throw at you if you're unprepared for it it's a yeah, it's it's not, you know, like if you don't have that locked and loaded. So, all right. So my last question, what advice would you give to a young actor in the middle of corn country who dreams of one day becoming an actor in Paris? Uh, what advice would I give? I mean, it's so hard to get out of corn country sometimes. And I don't mean metaphorically. I mean, literally to get out. When I was a kid, our, our family vacations, it, we had a great time, but we would go around in our minivan. We would drive for like two days straight to get somewhere. It's very expensive to fly in and out of some of those Midwestern uh, airports, for example. But I would just say travel as much as you can, even if you don't have the money for it. Don't don't wait forever until you have money saved up because you probably never will. Uh, <laughs> not in this economy. Just travel <laughs> like a star, starving artist while you can do it that way. And then if later you have more money, you can travel a little bit more comfortably, but uh, do the hostel thing, you know, do Facebook groups where other women host you in their homes and you do the same for them, you know, do work away, like do anything to travel, travel and expose yourself to a lot of new things and do something. It's a cliche, but do something that scares you all the time. Cause, uh, if nothing's scaring you, then you're you're not growing. Great answer. So where can people find you if they want to keep up to date with what's going on in your world? You can find me on Instagram, Lori Catwinks. It's Lori with an A. Uh, you can find me on IMDb or on Facebook. Man, I haven't updated much. I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you I have not been in the mood to update anything for a while. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's the thing too, is people don't tell you it's feast or famine. And, you know, I have been working and I have been doing a lot of different things, but when when people ask me like what I'm doing now, I'm like, ah, you know, nothing. Um, it did a corporate video the other day. It's so lame, but reality, like it's, it's exciting. It's fun. Yeah. You can, you can find me pretty easily. Instagram or something. (laughs) <laughs> well, I'll include links so that people can get in touch with your dream role of a French soap television star. <laughs> you give me, you, you know, I, I thought I was going to be auditioning for all like American tourist roles here, but that doesn't really happen. I thought I was going to be the girl who's like, hi, where's the Eiffel Tower? Uh, in the middle of a, a scene of, you know, real French actors. But uh, I, I, I just don't. Those roles come around so rarely, um, but you know, there's so many other things to do that is pretty, it's, it's been exciting. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you. This was really fun. Thank you for listening to City of Muses. If you've liked what you heard, please take a moment to rate and review it. This is the fastest and easiest way to help support the podcast. Tell a friend who could use a little inspiration. You can also subscribe to the Paris Underground Radio newsletter over on our website, parisundergroundradio.com, which comes out every Sunday and gives a little peek into what's on the network for the week ahead. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. You can find me on all socials at Jenny Foria. That's J-E-N-N-Y-P-H-O-R-I-A. Thank you for listening, and may you find inspiration wherever you go. City of Muses was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio.